So you have a couple of courses later next year that will be quite um, in line with what you're gonna learn in this course. So I'm gonna tell you what the course is about and I'm going to tell you a bit of a kind of like a trailer of the next few weeks. And by that I mean trailer like in a Hollywood sense really, like just a scoop of what you may actually encounter. And that means that you won't understand everything at all, actually, far less than everything. And that's okay. That's what a trailer is meant to be for. I mean, you don't want to, you still want to go to the cinema later, right? So it's just kind of like a short summary of what you will see. You won't get anything uh, or not everything, but the main concepts at least of what the course is going to be about uh, will be delivered in the next uh, two hours. We'll have a break in between, maybe two. It depends on how the ventilation of the room goes, if we can open the um, windows in between and also how the battery of my computer goes because I cannot plug in the battery on the projector and the camera and everything at the same time apparently. So we'll see how we work out, uh, work that out. So this is the course content. Um, today's, as I say, just a kind of trailer introduction and then we go into the atmosphere. So the course is structured in three blocks, kind of like following conceptually what the processes do of the ones that we're looking at in this, this course. So we start with the atmosphere. We have like three lectures on the atmosphere starting next week. We have a practical on the atmosphere, and then we move to the land. So what is the, the atmosphere doing to the land conditions? By land, I mean, for instance, vegetation, activity and state, soil moisture, soil temperature. So essentially the, as we call state of the land, the state variables of the land surface. So how they respond to the atmosphere variability that you have seen in previous lectures. So that block in land lasts again for about three lectures plus practical. And then we move to what I call the feedback. So how the land conditions affect the atmosphere. So we kind of like close that cycle. Okay, so we start with the atmosphere, we go to land and then back to the atmosphere. So atmosphere conditions, how they affect land surface, how land surface reacts to those and then what that reaction implies in turn for the atmosphere. An example of a feedback like that would be, for instance, it rains a lot, atmosphere, so moisture increases of land, then there is more evaporation because there is more water. So you have more moisture and maybe more rainfall issue. So as a feedback loop, right? So those interactions between land and atmosphere are bidirectional. So usually if you, if you have seen courses in ecology and so on, they usually take the atmosphere as a given. So you have a certain atmospheric forcing as we call, so atmosphere is a driver and the land responds to that. In this course, we are also looking at how that response of the land is affecting climate, how vegetation, soil moisture, soil temperature will change temperature in the atmosphere, precipitation, cloudiness, humidity, winds, and so on, right? So that, that is really what the course is about. Uh, we have three practicals, uh, one per, per block. Um, the practicals, they all add up together to a single story of a drought event. Uh, you'll see that. Uh, they use a computer software called GLASS, which is a model of a land atmosphere interface. Um, which is very useful for academic purposes. We also use it for research here at the lab sometimes, uh, but it is very good for academic purposes because it is very minimalistic. It just has the processes that you need to know. You can see the equations, you can track the changes, you can know what happens when I change this here what, to this other variable. So it's actually uh, very uh, structured, very modular and very conceptual. It has a very easy to use uh, user interface. So that's also a good reason for, for using it. And you will see that in the first lecture, you get acquainted with it quite rapidly. So that's for the practicals. At the end of the practicals, you have a report. That report accounts for 25% of the course and it's individual, okay? And it's essentially answering the questions that you have during the practical, showing that you actually um, did the assignments and, and what you learned. Okay, so that is nothing that you're not accustomed to. The other 25%, because the exam is 50%, is there something a bit more novel to you, but will be the EC 25%. It's a presentation, presentation for groups. Let's see how it works out with the current measures, but um, we'll get it to work. You have four 
scientific articles in Euphora already, and a folder that I think I call scientific articles or something like that. The other tool that I listed here in gray is the year, is the first letter of the, of the first author, I guess. Um, and those four papers, essentially, you have to pick one per group of four or five, because you guys are 18, I think. Let's see if in coming days the numbers change a little, but I presume that you would need to have like four people per group, maybe even five, okay? So let's say you organize in groups of four or five and you pick one journal article, each of you, okay? You have to organize yourself for that. So I hope that you have some form of person delegated that can organize these things uh, and let me know, okay, this is the group and this is the article that we're picking, okay? And you have time for that, but the earlier, uh, the better. It could be next week, it could be in two weeks, it depends on you. Uh, we, we're not in a rush at this stage, but it's good that you guys start reading your article notes. Like, they are articles of, uh, I think all of them high impact journals, which are usually very, very short, uh, like five pages or something like that, but they contain a lot of information. And what I want you to do is to read them, think about them critically, prepare a presentation in groups. So some of you will talk for five minutes, the other one will talk maybe for seven, it doesn't matter, but you should add up to something like 20 minutes max per, per paper. And in that presentation, you present the research as if it was yours. So this is what we did. You give kind of like the presentation of, a, of a scientific research is very similar to the structure of a paper. You have first an introduction. Well, this is why this is important. This is our gap in knowledge. And we are going to explore it. Then you have a method section in which you say, well, this is what we use. And then you have a result section. This is what we get. And these are the implications. And at the end, you have some conclusion. So that's kind of like you structure, the way you structure, if you happen to stay in, in science after your studies and you go to a conference in two or three years, um, you have to present how will be the structure that you will follow. Usually in conferences, it's only like 12 minutes that you have. Here you have a little longer, but you're also uh, in groups. So in that sense, I want you to present, as I said, the article like if it was yours, all right? So this is what we did and so on, because that'll actually allow you to get to understand it all, push you to understand it a bit better. And it is important that you guys get acquainted with reading scientific literature, synthesizing uh, that, that literature, and being able to present, because that, even if you don't say science, will be very important for you in the future. And I know that you don't get a lot of presentation in your study, so that'll be quite important. And in addition to that, you guys are going to peer mark the assignment, meaning that you're going to mark each other. Uh, there is a trick to that, but I'll explain in a second. Um, because it's important that you actually know what you're looking for in a presentation to be able to actually do it yourself. So we'll make sure that you actually mark your colleagues as well. And the trick to that, because I know that well, if you like your colleagues, you may give them a 10 over 10, if you hate them, you give them a zero over 10. Uh, so to prevent that from happening, what I usually do is that I have a plus minus two points score over my mark. So if you go really outlier, then it doesn't go into the average, right? So that's the way I usually do this peer marking. But uh, the objective of it is actually that you pay attention to your colleagues' talks, that you're able to know what is that you're looking for in their talks, so that you actually show that uh, particular feature and of course that you're able to ask questions afterwards as well, after paying attention. So, so that is actually something that we'll be doing in December, beginning of December, but we still don't have a date for that, okay? So that's also one of the reasons that I want to know as soon as possible the groups and the, and the papers that you pick, and then we start organizing that, that session. Uh, and as I say, it will be like 20 minutes each of you. We'll get back to this again. And if you have questions, we can just go through it during the lectures. Uh, when the time comes. So that's 25%. The other 25% is the uh, report from the practicals. And the other half of the course is the exam. The exam is fairly conceptual. So you do need to know some equations, at least the structure of the equation, how um, you can relate that to nature, but there won't be numerical exercises uh, in the exam. It will be mainly uh, getting you to think and discuss critically processes 
using equations and thinking of the of the, the stuff that we have actually seen in the lectures, but not solving numerically exercises. Okay. Um, so I'll I'll give you some example questions later on, but of course during the course we'll be revising what the structure of the exam will be in more detail. But it will be like four, five, six questions that uh, still kind of like cross lecture enough that is not just copy pasting a classification that you learn by heart. That is not what I'm looking for, but I want you to think and I want you to think in terms of mathematics and I want you to think in terms of processes, right? So that is uh, essentially the structure of the course. You can see the um, green letters here. Those are support material. They are book chapters and they correspond to the books that you see down here four books. They are all in the library, few copies, because you're only meant to be actually checking them in there. However, I do have for you, and it's already in you for all the PDFs of the chapters that you need, which are the ones that are listed here. But as I say, nonetheless, the books are in the library if you need to look at them uh, physically. There is no single good book on line and straight interactions to date, and that's why we have boring beer, touching different aspects of the course, because the course goes all the way from the top of the atmosphere straight boundary layer, so like two kilometers over our heads, down to the bedrock or the water table. So it's quite um, interdisciplinary. It, it really touches the soil, plant, atmosphere continuum. So it's not really easy to find books that actually match uh, the course content. Um, what, what are those support material uh, PDFs for? They're not for you to read before the lecture. They're not for you to read at home and learn by heart. They are for checking. They are a substitute to Google, if you wish. So if there is anything in the lectures that you don't understand, and of course you didn't ask me, which you can always do, um, that support material is there to give context to that. Okay, so nothing that is not in the lectures will come in the exam. I mean, it might be that something that is in the lectures very summarized, uh, you have to write a paragraph or two, but that's possible. But essentially, the support material is for support, is to give context to the stuff that you learn in the lectures. To some of you, it would be good to read it, or at least parts of it, to say, yeah, okay, this I, I didn't actually understand it correctly. For some of you with the lectures, if you're good at taking notes and at grasping things at the first time you hear them, it might not be necessary to check the, the support material frequently. Okay, but that is the, the, the reason the support material is there. You don't have to learn it by heart, it's support. Um, if there is anything in the support material that is not in the lectures, it won't be in the exam, it's not relevant to the course, or it is relevant, but not as relevant as other things, right? Um, so you don't need to learn it. If there is anything in the course support material and in the lectures that is explained different in both, the lectures prevail, all right? So the slides are what matters, that's the benchmark for the course, and the support material is just support, all right? Good. Um, and I don't think there is an option of anything that we explain in the lectures that is not in the support material. I think that the, the chapters I, I essentially cherry pick them very carefully to make sure that uh, the stuff that we see in the lectures is actually there if you want to consult some of the topics, right? The slices you probably see they are uh, quite uh, um, comprehensive. I do include quite a lot of things per slide and it's got to do with the fact that I want you to be able to study the course from the slides and the notes that you take. Uh, I know it's not you know, where to go to a presentation uh, count and they'll, they'll probably tell you this is way too much text per slide, but the reason for that is that I want you to, to actually be able to study the course from the slides. So I would definitely advise you to print them beforehand. I used to print them myself, but then some people brought them and then it was a bit of a mess because we throw a lot of paper and I just felt guilty about it. So this year, uh, you guys bring it. And um, if you want, if you don't want, you don't have to, of course. Um, so that's about it for the course structure. Uh, the lectures will be here always. The practicals will be in the second floor, all right? The exam and the group presentations, we still don't have a date. 
Any questions so far? Yes. The are uh, actually I think it's good that uh, I mean, it would be good if it was in Dutch for my Dutch, but I think it's good that you guys are in English. Uh, because if you eventually happen to stay in science, you will have to present them in English. You will never encounter a situation in which you go to a conference and you have to present in Dutch. So yeah. Um, these are the people in yeah, go ahead. Is the exam in English too? The exam is also in English. The entire course is in English. And it's for your own good. It's not because I couldn't do it in Dutch, which probably would be a complete mess. Uh, but um, it's actually because you then later also have all the courses in the masters that will be in English, and I think it's beneficial for you. So, yeah. Any other question? I'm aware of the fact that uh, it is not common to get courses in English for you. So, um, I'll, uh, yeah, bear that in mind. Um, these are the people that are involved in the um, in the course, uh, yeah, actually that's me in the bad days, but the, um, the uh, main lecturer is myself, um, so I'm a professor here, uh, my name is Diego, um, just Diego, no, Professor Miralles, right, <laughs> like that is, makes me feel super old. Um, so before being here, I was professor in Bristol for three years, but that was back in 2000. Uh, 12 to 8, 15 or something like that. And then I did my PhD in Amsterdam. Um, I worked in, in Washington, D.C. at the USDA, the U.S. Department of Agriculture and in NASA. And before that, I was uh, in England and then I did my, my master's in the Netherlands and also a master's in, in Amsterdam, in, in Madrid, Madrid. That's where I'm from and that's actually the most beautiful city in the world. Um, so that's me. Irina is a postdoctoral researcher in my team. Um, she's been there for four years now. Um, she studied in the Russian State University uh, of Hydrometeorology in St. Petersburg. Then she moved to Germany where she stayed a few years to do another master's and, or master's and a PhD at the Max, Max Planck Institute for Meteorology and she will be taking care of the practice. And then we have two guest lectures. Uh, you probably saw it in the previous course content table that in lecture seven and nine, we have also, I guess, presentation. So they are shorter lectures of about an hour and then about one hour of guest lecture, all right? And that guest lecture will be a presentation of about 40 minutes and some questions. And those two are researchers in my team. Uh, Dominic is working on land feedbacks, as you see there, and Brianna Pagan is working on hydroinformatics and remote sensing. Uh, Dominic comes from uh, Zurich. He studied in, in ETH uh, and then he worked in Media Suisse. And currently he's doing a PhD with me. And then Brianna uh, comes from California. She did her uh, studies in UCLA and in Loyola. And then uh, in the present, she's also working in Quito as a scientist and doing a PhD uh, with me. So. Those are the people that you'll see throughout the course. And um, let me see if that works because I touched it. And this is actually where we come from. So this is the um, hydrology and climate team. Uh, we are upstairs, second floor. Anytime that you want to pass by, you're welcome. My room is the room that you see here. It's in front of the computer room that you'll use for the practicals, uh, if you're familiar with it. Uh, so the one just in front of it is my office. Um, and the teams that we study range from atmosphere interactions and feedbacks, climate extremes like droughts, heat waves, and how we monitor them with uh, satellites, how we model them, um, and how we go to the field and sample the variables that are necessary to understand this process. So very related to the water cycle at usually global scales and interactions with climate through vegetation as well. So, um, the course, actually, as I mentioned before, 
<clears throat> is meant to be the foundation for two other courses that come later in year four. One of them is in the first semester, is this meteorology and ecoclimatology course that will be taught by Hans Verbeek. And the second one is this one, uh, climate change processes I'm currently uh, developing, uh, will be taught for the first time next year, and you will get it in two years because the second semester, right? So I'm gonna teach it this academic year for the first time. Uh, so in February, and then you will get in February in the next academic year, right? Um, so those courses, they are on climate and meteorology and they build up in scale, right? Here in this course, we're gonna see that one point or ecosystem scale vertical uh, processes as changes between land and atmosphere and so on. Then you go into the meteorology and ecoclimatology and you look at processes that are multi-day to year and are taking a continental scale, etc. And then in the climate change processes, we start looking at decades and centuries and global scale, right? So they work in that way. They are increasing in, in, in spatial extent and in temporal scale. The course that we have now is really from minute to day and it's really ecosystem scale maximum, all right? So this is the lecture for today. As I say, it's just a trailer, really. So I'm just going to give you a bit of an interaction of what you're going to see in coming weeks. Um, so if there is any question right now, then we can solve it before we go. No? Is it cold? Oh, you guys. Good cold, right? No? Is it okay? All right. Um, okay. So. Why land atmospheric interactions? Um, what is that we're going to look at in this course? I think you already got a bit of a, an idea about it. I don't know where to put the, the Zoom thing so that it doesn't bother you guys. Uh, maybe this corner, I use it less. Um, no idea. Maybe like this. Yeah, that works. Um, so, it, yeah, go ahead. You can also minimize it. I can minimize it, right? Uh, so it's still gonna be seen at home, obviously, if they want to, it's a user dependent. Yeah, so I'll do that, that makes sense. So it's still recording and so on, you think, right? You have zero idea about this, the first time I use it. Um, okay, so the course builds upon two kind of like pillars. The first one is eco-hydrology, and the second one is micrometeorology. Now, what is eco-hydrology? It's really the interaction between plants and water. So how do plants use water? What plants imply for the hydrological cycle? So essentially all the fluxes and states of hydrology and ecology, all right? So that is what eco-hydrology is about, plant-water interactions. Micrometeorology deals with the meteorology or the state of the atmosphere in the very thin atmosphere on top of the land, usually just a few hundred meters, what we call the atmospheric boundary layer. Uh, we'll go to that layer. But micrometeorology is kind of like microscale meteorology, it's a name actually uh, says. So it's referring to the state and dynamics of the atmosphere next to the ground, which is the atmosphere that we experience. So it's very important for us. It's the temperature, the humidity and so on in which we live. Um, and it's also the humidity and temperature in which vegetation lives and interacts with, all right? So when we put together those two things, we end up with our land atmospheric interactions course, which is essentially dealing with how vegetation, soil moisture, and soil properties affect the transfer of water, carbon, and heat between land and atmosphere in both directions. So all the transfers of heat, moisture, and chemicals, in particular carbon, between land and atmosphere. That's what we are going to look at at a kind of like vertical scale. So looking at vertical fluxes, right? So the extent of the course is really from, essentially from the water table or the root depth to the top of the atmospheric boundary layer. ABL stands for atmospheric boundary layer. As I said before, you're gonna see these concepts many times later. So don't worry if you don't catch uh, something today. This is the atmospheric boundary layer. 
the atmosphere boundary layer, maybe I can just give you a 10 seconds interaction. This is the low part of the atmosphere that is well mixed because of the roughness of the surface and the heat and the moisture that is being transferred from the surface. So it's just convective, it is well mixed, and then you have an inversion on top of that. And then you have a normal troposphere. But that little layer is like in a, in a water pipe. You always have like a boundary layer when water is flowing through a pipe, right? It's this the part of the, of the flow that is affected by the roughness of the surface of where which is flowing, right? And it's affected by the roughness, but also by the changes of heat and moisture in our case in the planet. So the first few hundred years of the atmosphere where most of the weather events actually happen and where we live, that's the atmospheric boundary layer. Why do we focus on that part of the atmosphere? Not just because the most important one, weather-wise, but also because the one that is affected, affected and affecting the ecosystems. There's a few hundred meters in some places like the tropics, you can go to a few kilometers, four or five kilometers, but usually it's a few hundred meters. Right now it's very good. So, let's... Um, so I'm gonna put some variable names to this arrow. So it's gonna look a little crowded for a second. I uh, hope it doesn't look too scary. No. We're gonna look at these three cycles, the energy cycle, carbon cycle, and the water cycle. Carbon in particular, um, a little less than the other two, and specifically for CO2, because it's very important for climate, right, and for vegetation. Um, so we're gonna look at carbon a little less than the other two, but we will also discuss carbon cycle in this course. Now, regarding the surface energy uh, balance and the energy cycle, I think you've already got some pictures, as I said, but it's important that you can like grasp a bit of what this black is actually mean. So this is just the top of the atmosphere, forget about it for a second. Let's look at the flat surface. You have essentially outgoing radiation short and long, and you have incoming radiation short and long. We'll have a lecture on this at the ecosystem scale, so I'll worry about it. But you know that the balance between these two, what comes and leaves in terms of radiation, we call it surface net radiation, right? And it's this term in the equation, is R and that's surface net radiation. So it's what comes minus what goes in terms of radiation. So those are the orange flags, those are radiation flags. Radiation is a, is a form of energy transfer, but there are other forms of energy transfer, like conduction of energy, convection, those are to the, the red arrows that you see here. Those are not radiation, but they are energy transports. Especially these two are very, very important in this course. Probably the two most important variables in this course, the latent and the sensible heat flux. All right? Latent heat flux is this one, sensible heat flux is this one. And they are just means for dissipating that net radiation that you have in here. So you have a certain surplus of radiation at the surface, and that usually gets partitioned mainly across those two fluxes, either sensible or latent heat. What are they? Well, the sensible is just warming, and the latent is just evaporation, right? Warming and evaporation. If you have extra radiation here, you can either warm the land and then conduct the heat to the atmosphere, so the air gets warmer, or that radiation is actually used to evaporate water and that water vapor moves into the atmosphere. The latter is latent heat flux, the former is sensible heat flux. We call it sensible because we sense it, it's a change in temperature, right? This is a sensible heat flux, it's a change in air temperature. Latent heat flux, you don't experience any change in temperature. The energy is being used to evaporize water, so I experience the change in humidity with the latent heat flux. Why is it called heat if it's just humidity? Because the energy that is used to vaporize the water is actually still there in the water vapor. And when it moves up in the atmosphere, cools down and condenses, it releases the same amount of energy that it absorbed in the first place. So that's why we call it a latent transfer of heat because the heat, the radiation is being used Evaporize the water to break the hydrogen bonds to essentially transfer liquid into gas. And that energy is still captured somehow in the water vapor, 
uh, when it condenses and forms a liquid again, it's released in the atmosphere. It's a latent source of paint. Um, if you remember from high school, when you have phase changes by liquid to uh, gas, you spend a lot of energy because you don't change the temperature, right? Um, so that's essentially a sensible heat, uh, latent heat, right? So the, um, those two fluxes, sensible heat and latent heat, are very important in this course, all right? So if you think of this equation here, which is a surface energy balance equation, a way to present the surface energy balance, you can see different ones during the course. What you see is that if you have a certain surplus of radiation, this R N N radiation, and let's say that that surplus is partitioned into sensible and latent heat flux mainly, we'll go through these ones later in the course, but they are minor compared to these two, the sensible and latent heat. Let's say your latent and sensible heat are very small. So there is an extra radiation still there, but you would experience if you change the surface temperature. That's what this equation means. It's essentially telling you that if you have more energy coming than what you're able to dissipate, the, the system warms up. If you dissipate more energy, it fluxes like it's latent and sensible heat and so on, that what is coming from the radiation, then you're gonna cool down. You're spending energy from the system. All right? So that's what this differential means. It's just a differential of surface temperature over time, and it will be zero if everything balances and it happens during long periods. But if you have suddenly more energy coming down when you manage to dissipate the fluxes, then you have a warming. That differential of surface temperature over time will be possible. All right? That surface temperature it is your state variable of the land surface or for heat, right? So if you think of energy, state variable is the temperature of the land surface, land surface temperature. So that is really the state variable when you're tracing energy cycles for the land surface, land surface temperature. For the atmosphere is the air temperature. That's what TA means here. So the state in terms of heat of the atmosphere is measured by temperature of the atmosphere. That's a state variable in the case of uh, energy, temperature. The state variable in the case of vegetation, uh, sorry, in the case of carbon, is the CO2 concentration of in the atmosphere. And I'm focusing it on carbon dioxide for the purpose of this course. So for the atmosphere, you have your CO2 concentration, and inland, you have essentially the amount of stock, or the stock of carbon that you have over the land. That's your state variable in terms of carbon for the land surface, right? And there are fluxes between those as well. So you have the balance between photosynthesis and thinking of carbon into gross primary production, and the outflux of respiration, essentially. The R stands essentially for respiration. And you will see, and you probably know already that this has an implication. So in the case of the carbon balance, this is the most simple carbon cycle that you can picture. You have photosynthesis taking CO2 from the atmosphere and then respiration putting it back into the atmosphere. And if you have an imbalance between those two, you have a differential. If you think of the land surface, you can have a positive differential when you have more photosynthesis than respiration. If you think about the CO2 concentration, you have a positive differential when you have uh, less photosynthesis than respiration. You have an accumulation. That's the differential that you have here. NEP, I'll explain in a second like this, but it stands for net ecosystem productivity or net ecosystem production, right? And it's essentially the balance of these two, the GPP and the R. So if you do one minus the other, that's what you get. But you'll see in a second in the next slide, uh, a bit more detail on that. So that's the surface carbon balance equation or one way of presenting the surface carbon balance equation. That is analogous to this energy balance. And then you have the water balance, which is probably the one that you have seen the most, or maybe not, but certainly you have seen it already with Nico, um, which is essentially telling you that if you have certain precipitation coming, you can either evaporate that precipitation or it will flow to rivers and get back to the ocean, right? So essentially, you have certain precipitation, part of it is infiltrated. Part of it will go into river runoff. Part of what it is infiltrated, maybe, 
So as you know, you probably know already, you certainly know already, I think. Um, the uh, river runoff, this that I call Q here to simplify, can be through overland flow. So it can be water from rain that is not infiltrated, or it can infiltrate and then come under the surface of the river, which in English we call it face flow. Um, so essentially this Q, if we think of it as runoff or discharge for your aquifers, would be the mixture of the water that goes over land and the water that is infiltrated and goes under the surface, right? Um, I think I would know the touch terms for that, but I'm not going to write it down. Um, but you, you certainly know what I'm talking about. Now, the precipitation, as I say, comes in, part of it is infiltrated and goes to rivers, part of it is infiltrated, uh, part of it is, is just to, uh, going over the land to the rivers. And part of what is infiltrated actually is taken up by the roots again and put into the atmosphere through transpiration. Part of it evaporates directly from the soil without the roots being taken uh, and taking the water, which is what we call evaporation, soil evaporation versus soil evaporation. Um, essentially, a very simple water balance, so mass balance, which is what the water balance is at the end of the day. What are the state variables? You have your humidity in the atmosphere and you have your soil moisture in the time. Of course, so much at different layers, the same as for the temperature of the, of the carbon stock, if you want to actually think of the land surface as a multi-layer uh, um, spectrum <clears throat> or domain. So if you look at the water balance equation, same thing. If you have more precipitation coming in than evaporation and runoff leaving, then you have an accumulation of water, right? That's what we call differential and so moisture all the time being possible, right? If you have in the atmosphere the Q, you can also draw the analogous atmosphere of water balance situation. You will have a differential of Q over time that will be positive if you have more evaporation and precipitation. So you have an accumulation of humidity in the atmosphere. And those are just continuity equations. So water ba oh, balance equations are very simple. They can get more complicated, but if you understand them, uh, then you can start thinking in terms of physics about the environment that surrounds you. And that's actually quite important. Now, the um, links that you see here are all interacting among each other. And that's what I'm going to try to focus on for the rest of the lecture today. So these, link, these cycles that you see here are linked together. And their links are very obvious, uh, like this one in here of latent heat and evaporation, because latent heat, as I said before, the latent heat flux is just evaporation. In fact, it's the energy used to evaporate the water, but it's just evaporation. It's latent heat. Actually, this E here stands for evaporation. And this is the latent heat of vaporization lambda that you will see in the next lecture, which is essentially the energy that it takes to evaporate one gram of water. So multiply times how much water is evaporated, then you get the energy that it takes to evaporate all that water. That's what the latent heat flux is. So, of course, it's evaporation. It's the same thing by different units. One is in units of heat, and the other one is in units of moisture, water, mass. All right. So, that is an obvious link. You have the energy balance and the water balance completely tied together because of evaporation. Because evaporation takes energy from the sun, this radiation surplus, and radiation we have here, and it puts it back into the atmosphere through like a heat flux, right? And that powers the hydrological cycle. You have your evaporation, and then that is moisture, transformation, then rain, and so on. So those two, the two cycles are certainly coupled uh, very um, synchronously. Synchronously, I didn't mean, get but you got that. Um, so the, uh, that link is, is, is very obvious. There are many other links in here. In, if you look at the carbon, for instance, I'm, I'm going to go through that in the next few slides, but you can see that the NEP, the net primary production or the net system production, is also a sink of energy because plants in photosynthesis they take energy from the sun. Do they take a lot? No, very little. It's a very small percentage of all the energy that comes from the sun. But it's true that that is linked to the carbon cycle because photosynthesis uses that energy and converts it into chemical energy, glucose, and so on. That plants can consume later. So that's a link between this the energy and carbon balances. And then you'll see that the carbon balance and water balance link happens throughout the stomata opening and closure, mainly, but they're all the 
uh, factors. And in essence, anything that is affected by vegetation is linked to the carbon cycle because vegetation is carbon. So if you have an accumulation of carbon in land in biomass, and by growing that biomass, you're changing weather, you're changing the heat and moisture transfers. Of course, your cycles are going to tie together to the carbon cycle. All right. So that NEP that I put in here is actually, and maybe this is confusing because I use the R for respiration, is not the autotrophic respiration, not the respiration from biomass, it's not the not biomass, sorry for that from plants. Um, so the respiration from plants is what we call the autotrophic respiration. You take the GDP and you subtract the respiration from plants, then you get what we call the net primary production, which is the biomass, right? It's just building up of biomass. When you have a forest that you just planted and it starts growing, it's because it's sinking more uh, carbon through photosynthesis than what it's actually putting back in the atmosphere as respiration. But they will go through those processes maybe later in the course. But I think that you've already got courses in that. Now, if in addition to that, we consider the heterotrophic respiration from the soil, uh, microbes and, and, and so on, then you get actually an extra flux of CO2 into the atmosphere. And the remaining, which is a little smaller than the net primary fraction, is the net ecosystem exchange. Right? And if in addition, we think that, well, that forest may actually burn eventually. Or there might be uh, plaques that kill the trees and so on, and that will release the carbon into the atmosphere from the biomass that was accumulated. Then we also remove that, which is a carbon flux into the atmosphere, and we end up with what we call the NEP, the net ecosystem productivity, which is the one that you had in the previous slide. And that is the long term carbon storage in your ecosystem, which is usually close to zero unless you suddenly plant a forest here and look in 50 years you have a forest. So, of course, all that biomass has been your accumulation of carbon in the system. All right. But usually, if you look at a mature forest like the Amazon, you don't have an NEP that's positive all the time, at least not over a prolonged period of time, because it's already balanced in terms of carbon dates and um, releases. Okay, any question? You guys still okay? Um, let me see the battery. I cannot see the battery, right? No. Okay, let's hope we're okay and it doesn't switch off. Um, the, um, this is something that I've already kind of like mentioned very briefly, like why plants are important for water, but also why water might be important for plants. And it's something that is intuitive and you guys know. One thing is that first of all, the water molecules are used in the photosynthetic reactions, right? So the plants take CO2, they take water from the ground, they use the light and then they form glucose and they expel oxygen to the atmosphere. That's it. The photosynthetic reaction, the easiest one that you can think of. So, Water is being used by plants in the leaves to photosynthesize and create the, the glucose, they are carbon um, that then they may consume to form, to produce energy that they can use to grow or they can use to maintain their activities and so on. So that's one thing. How much water is being consumed by plants in photosynthesis? Very little. Say two, three percent of what they are absorbing from the root system. Now, but they need that actually to perform the photosynthesis. Now, water also maintains the structure of the plants, especially those that don't have lignified tissues, uh, like grass and so on, they don't have water, they just wilt. All right. So that is actually one reason, of course, plants need to have water. It's just like us, they're like 90% water. So they are formed by water. They are depending on water for their cell turgidity an entire plant structure. And uh, in addition to that, they use it to solve nutrients and to distribute them. So a bit like us with the blood, right? So there is nothing uh, different in that sense. And sometimes they even use it to cool down, like we do as well when it's very warm, you can transpire and that actually prevents you from warming up further, which is actually a perfect example of sensible and latent heat. You have a certain amount of energy. Imagine you put yourself in the sun and you start sweating. That is because your body is using that energy to vaporize the water inside your body 
instead of warming up your body. So it's a reaction of your body to dissipate that energy uh, in a way that you don't warm up too much. So limiting the sensible heat by creating a latent heat as a form of dissipation of that radiation that you're using. That's essentially how an ecosystem works, also how plant works through transpiration. But there is one thing that is different for us, uh, for plants. I said that plants actually use only like two, three percent of the water they take from the roots for photosynthesis. Even if they are composed by water, we are also composed by water. We are not drinking like 2,000 percent more water than we need. Um, we are not like exudating that water constantly through sweating like plants do, right? So that is kind of like weird in that sense. Like, why would plants actually need that much water? Uh, or at least take that much water that they can use, right? So that's actually my next question. And last year, what we did was we had kind of like the devices to vote and so on, but I thought that with the COVID, what did not the most hygienic things to actually distribute the devices. So uh, probably I wouldn't have allowed me anyway. So I think we're just gonna go old fashioned here and waste our time. So I'm first gonna read the question and the answer, and then go back one by one. So you have to choose only one, and you have to choose one. Um, so the question is exactly what I just mentioned. Like if you have more than 95% of the water that plants take being directly lost through transpiration into the atmosphere, the question is why would they actually do that? Why would they throw out 95% of the water they take into the atmosphere? And the possibilities are plants need to waste water to get food from the earth. Roots constantly pump up water no matter what. Plants choose to have a self supply of rainfall. Leaves moist in the air to prevent dehydrating, or God likes it this way. So, who thinks it's A? Plants need to waste water to get their food from the air. Come on, be brave. Your, your mates are not going to laugh with you there. Come on. Okay. Who thinks roots constantly pump up water no matter what? All right, that's a few hands left. Crazy man, don't be afraid. Okay, let me show you. Plants choose to have a self supply of rainfall. Okay, very poetic. Uh, leaves moist and beer to prevent dehydration. Cool. God likes it this way. Great, because I'm going to keep on pushing for long. Um, good. So the right answer is A. And you guys all fail. Come on. There are some of them that are less plausible than others. The last one is certainly not very plausible, but uh, uh, some of the other ones can be confusing. So we can quickly review those. Maybe we can start by B. So roots constantly pump up water, no matter what, is actually not technically wrong. But the, the truth is that roots don't pump. Pumping is just putting pressure to, to put the water out. Right? We've seen with Kathy that uh, you see Oh, at least the theory that we follow, the thinking about hydraulic transport in plants is a cohesion tension theory, which implies that transpiration, in fact, is the source of movement, if you wish. So it's not being it's not water being pumped from the roots, but water being sucked by the leaves when they transpire. And that moves the entire column of water. You can have root pressure, which is something else happens in some plants, but it's not usually the mechanism that's that. All right, so that's why B is not the right answer. Plants choose to have a self-supply of rainfall. I really like that one too, but uh, it's not true. Actually, if, if you think about it, it's not uh, completely uh, nuts because if, uh, I mean, what does it mean? If, of course, plants don't have a consciousness, but we can still say, well, plants don't want to dehydrate. Uh, plants choose to have a supply of rain what, what we're doing by saying that actually is uh, it's not that absurd because if you think in evolutionary terms what that means is that plants of course they, they have had mutations throughout their history of evolution and some of them that actually were more applied to actually produce rainfall during times in which they need it 
succeeded in reproducing and passing those mutations to their offspring. And then that is the plan that we find nowadays out there. So that's essentially how consciousness in terms of evolution works, right? So you have randomness and then the adaptations that work evolutionary are the ones that pass through history. And then, so it could be that actually plants that for whatever reason, they are capable of producing rain for themselves are more likely to have survived evolution. I'm not saying they are doing it consciously, but a mutation could actually explain that. Uh, it wouldn't be too, too productive or too effective. That's the only issue because if you, you have the water in the soil that you need, then why you, would you put it up in the sky so light falls again and you take it? So um, I like the answer, but I don't think it, it actually worked by it. That being said, plants do provide a lot of the waste so that you can see. If you look at a plant, of course not because it moves the moisture moves. But if you look at the Amazon, for instance, a lot of the moisture that falls in the form of rain from the Amazon comes from evaporation of the Amazon. So at the scale of ecosystems, uh, you have a certain precipitation recycling ratio that we call uh, that can range from 20 to 80 percent. It depends on, on the size of the ecosystem and it depends on how much it evaporates and so on. But now, um, leaves moisten the air to prevent dehydrating. That is uh, not too bad neither, but it's not really true. So it's true that plants, if they have very high vapor pressure deficits, they, they are exposed to very dry air. They don't like it as a matter of clothes because they don't want to be hydrated. But it won't be too effective if you actually put the water in the air to actually prevent the water from flowing up because you're essentially putting the water in the first place. So it's not a conscious decision for, or it's not actually what plants do as a strategy to prevent dehydration. Consume more water to wet in the air. Um, yeah. It does, I mean, you have to consume the water in the first place to put it in the air to prevent transpiration from happening. So, not too effective. So, what actually happens is that, uh, yeah, it's A, the plants need to waste water, water to get their food from the air. So, essentially, as you know, you have your stomata cells, and they're the only candidates to which water and CO2 are exchanged with the atmosphere. They don't have pores. The plants don't want to lose water, but they want to capture CO2 from the atmosphere because it's their food, it's what they use for photosynthesis. When the cavity is open, the stomata open to capture CO2, the CO2 molecule is big, it's heavy. The water molecules they have inside, they are very volatile, they are small, they are easily escaping. So if you open that cell, that's the matter to capture CO2. The unavoidable result of that is that water that you have inside leaks into the atmosphere. There is no way for plants to prevent that from happening. You want to take a CO2 molecule, big molecule, you have to lose your volatile small water molecules that you have inside. Because they are exposed to the that, that water that the plant has on the leaves that initially actually is liquid water taken from the roots, right? In the leaves, as opposed to the radiation and so on, evaporizes. The net radiation, as we said before, vaporizes the water, they can keep it, right? So when you have that water vapor inside the leaf, it's super volatile. So if you open the stomata, that goes. That's a transpiration of the plant, all right? So there is no way for plants to photosynthesize, to capture the air CO2 from the atmosphere, the food, which is the CO2, without actually losing the water in the process. Plants don't even want to transpire. Very seldom plants want to transpire. When do plants want to transpire? They want to transpire when they are super warm. That won't happen here here in Nova. And of course, the transpiration may help them actually pushing nutrients up and so on, but that could be done possible. It's not really the purpose of transpiration. The truth is that plants use 2,000% more water than they need because they cannot avoid it by using the plant using that water in the process of taking CO2 from the atmosphere, right? And maybe a kind of like visual uh, break, we take a real break. Uh, so this is the Amazon rainforest. Uh, it's about uh, 500 million square kilometers of trees, uh, pristine environment. 
Uh, you have about five billion trees like this, and each of them consume to about a hundred thousand liters of water per day. So five billion trees, thousand liters of water per day. And if you put that number, those number together, then what you get actually is that the entire transpiration of the Amazon rainforest is about twice as much as the planet that goes through the Amazon Atlantic Ocean. So if you think of the Amazon as this massive sea of water when it gets to the Atlantic. If you think about how much, how many liters of water that carries per year, you multiply that times two, and it's the moisture that's being pumped by trees in the Amazon into the atmosphere. Transpiration is twice as much as the river runoff in the Amazon. It's huge. And that uses a lot of energy. In fact, if you do the calculation, you get that more than 80,000 nuclear power plants will be needed to actually evaporate all that water. Uh, the Amazon is doing, of course, for free using the energy from the sun. And that's why you see this impact on clouds, you see this impact on rainfall, to sort of convective storms that you see forming, that they can move far away to Africa, uh, as you can see here. So with that, I think it becomes quite clear that first you have a connection between the energy and water cycles, all that energy can be used to operate water. Also with the carbon cycle, because all those trees, you don't want to lose that water. That water. That is water that you're losing because you want to capture CO2 from the atmosphere. And they are affecting climate patterns. They are affecting rainfall, cloudiness in many places, not just at the forest itself, as we were discussing before, but also in other regions, downwind, if you wish. So we're going to have a short break. Uh, I'm not sure if we can have it short, but I have to ventilate the room, but let's, let's uh, if you're okay with that, maybe we can leave the windows a little open for a few minutes, and then we can just have a break of about 15 minutes, uh, if that's okay. All right? Okay. Any questions, by the way? Yes. I was wondering about the preparation in the workplace. Yes. We'll get to that later, actually. Uh, yes. The, uh, the video of the Amazon, you, you've seen that uh, it can really have a very strong impact of uh, the education transpiration on the climate, not just locally, but also at global scales. As you mentioned before, also on temperature, we'll see that later. But um, in essence, what, what, what I wanted to transfer with that video is that uh, transpiration is a very powerful flux of water. It takes a lot of energy and it happens because plants need to capture CO2. So that way you're actually linking all those three cycles together just with, with a single uh, variable or process. Right? Interception rules. I'm not sure about what the word is in Dutch, but I, I think you know what I mean. But, um, it's also a very important flux of water. Uh, it happens when it rains and then plants actually take the water on their surface and evaporate it back into the atmosphere. So that is not water being taken by the roots and evaporated through the stomata and photosynthesis happens. But it's actually water that stands on top of the leaves and the tracks and then evaporate it because the passing air and so on the energy that we get from the sun. So in that sense, interception levels, which for the Amazon is about 20% of the, the total rainfall, um, and about 40% of the transpiration, actually, or 30% of the transpiration, um, is a very big flux as well, a lot lower than transpiration, which takes about, transpiration is about 70% globally of the total land evaporation. By the way, I don't use the word public transpiration, but you probably find it in uh, For me, evaporation is everything, because as you have seen before, transpiration is also evaporation. It's evaporation of water on the leaves. So I only use the word evaporation, land evaporation, terrestrial evaporation, to mean everything. To mean transpiration, which is the biggest flux, interception loss, which is the second biggest flux, together with the third, that is soil direct soil evaporation from the pores of the soil. So that, that, all that are uh, different fluxes of evaporation. And actually, you can see the different components of land evaporation. Big one, transpiration, 60 to 80% global. Interception, which is about 10%, and bare soil evaporation, the same about 10%. And then you have snow sublimation, so it's the direct vaporization of snow, solid water. And 
open water operation. Technically speaking, sublimation is not an operation. It's still um, taking us out of the operation. Essentially, the transfer of solid to gas called sublimation. All right? So that is for the land, of course, all the oceans. We also have ocean operation, which is straightforward. This is one single source of the operation, which is the open water. Okay. Um, I have some numbers here. Uh, nothing for you to memorize. As I said before, this course is not uh, about global scales. It's really about ecosystem scales. And the only reason I put that is to give you a bit of context. But I guess it's important for you to know that uh, over the oceans, you have more evaporation than precipitation. Over the land, you have more precipitation than evaporation. And it cannot be all the way, all, all the way because you cannot evaporate more water than what you get on the land, right? So you have a certain am amount of volume precipitation over a long period. That's the maximum evaporation that you can have if it is a long period. That's the input of, of water that you get. That applies usually, unless you have a lake or something like that, it's constantly drying out or an aquifer from which you're pumping at, at very high rates. That usually applies to the entire continental land. So you have more precipitation than evaporation. And in the oceans, you have the opposite. Because at the global scale, you have to have the same amount of precipitation and evaporation as you come back, right? It's a cycle. So global precipitation and global evaporation are equal over the long period. And they are distributed in motion and land that way. You have more evaporation in the ocean than the precipitation. And over land, you have more precipitation than evaporation. And one reason we know that over land, we have more precipitation than evaporation is because we have rivers bringing water from land into the ocean. Otherwise, where is the water coming? Right? So over land, the water balance will be precipitation equals evaporation plus river run. If you take a long period and you discard the change in soil moisture in time, that differential that you saw in the water balance equation. Over the oceans, you will have the precipitation or the evaporation equals the precipitation plus the river line that comes from the ocean from the continents, right? And also think of atmosphere water balance if you wish, but I'm not going to get this one. Uh, essentially implies precipitation, evaporation, and the moisture. Advection towards advection is for something movement in the air. We use it a lot, right? We want a lot of advection of moisture and advection of heat, right? So, vegetation uh, plays a key role in transpiration and interception loss. Okay, that's what I wanted to point out with this, and uh, also point to the fact again that vegetation is carbon. It's a central element in the carbon balance, and that indicates that there is a link between the carbon balance and the water cycle. It is not the only way by which vegetation affects the hydrological cycle. So I can tell you a few of us. You already saw that vegetation affects precipitation, and that is partly because of what we mentioned, or largely because of what we mentioned, that transpiration uses uh, or puts a lot of water into the atmosphere. And that generates clouds and may trigger rainfall locally or downwind. Okay, you saw it in the video of the Amazon. But there are other reasons why more vegetation typically means more precipitation. One of them is that it acts as an orographic barrier. I'm not sure if you remember me from high school that sometimes you have a mountain, the air is coming and it's lifted, it pulls down from the clouds, leads to where you want them to try and continue. So it's the best search on this. So that is called orographic rainfall. You can also form it with the forest. You have the air coming to the forest, and then because of the roughness of the forest and the physical barrier that it implies, the air slows down, there is a convergence, there is like a traffic jump of air and it's lifted. And that pulls the air, forms clouds on top of the forest, and they need rainfall. Okay? In addition to those two factors, you also have the vegetation sometimes acts as a net trapping moisture from the air. So if you have like a cloud, let's think of a cloud, for instance, in which you have liquid water. So most of the water in the cloud is liquid, especially if it's low, uh, high, it could be ice. But if you think of fog uh, here, which clouds, uh, the little, most of the water we contain is in liquid water, little droplets. 
that if you pass that passing air over a net of vegetation, then a lot of the times what vegetation does is capturing those droplets, and then those droplets form bigger droplets that go down a stem flow so through the trunks into the soil and infiltrate. So there are ecosystems like this one, which is a mountain rainforest, in which the main supply of precipitation or the main supply of water of plastic inspired photosynthesis is actually the passing clouds of fog. And then they capture that way the from the fog. From the fog. We call that a cold precipitation or horizontal precipitation. Okay. So it's kind of like a positive interception loss. A negative interception loss will be rains and then you evaporate, so you have less moisture for the plant that you would actually have if the plant wasn't being intercepted. But this is actually the opposite. You have more moisture for the plant because of the fact that the plant is capturing directly the moisture from the plant. Right? Finally, you have a fourth factor here, which is volatile organic compounds. I'm not sure if you've seen it in any course, but essentially volatile organic compounds are organic molecules that are spelled by trees, certain type of trees, that actually react in the atmosphere. And they can form other molecules. But one very important thing is that they can act as rainfall nuclei. So to form a droplet of water that may rain later, so uh, to form a cloud, if you wish, you need to have two things. You need to have humidity, and you need to have some molecule of the size of an aerosol that the molecules of va uh, vapor can actually adhere to, to form a bigger droplet. So you not, not only do you need, not only do you need uh, water vapor to form clouds, but you also need to have these little molecules in the air over which the cloud droplets stick or bigger droplets, right? Those we call it precipitation nuclei or cloud nuclei. And trees produce those consciously or not, as we mentioned before, what does it mean consciously? Well, whether that has been an evolutionary advantage for trees to reproduce when they actually had that particular trait is something else. But what is true is that there are trees that do produce those and that typically generates more clouds. It's like when you actually pump like a silver silica and so on into the into the earth from clouds, all, all these engineering things that they sometimes really generate when you pump, they're based on the same principle. So you actually pump aerosols into the atmosphere that act as nucleus for the droplets to adhere and form clouds. The trees actually do that. Some trees, particular coniferous, for instance, in the pines, the down here. Okay, so more vegetation, more latent heat flux, so more evaporation. We saw it before, but also more precipitation. In addition, more vegetation is more infiltration. In this you've seen it probably in the forces already, I'm not sure. But typically, you have many reasons for which you may think that if you have forest infiltration, it's going to be hard. First of all, you have more organic matter in the soil, so that usually keeps the soil more porous. You have a good structure, you have a good texture, you have more porosity, you have the, the soil well structure. In addition, the roots may cause macropores for the water to bypass and infiltrate and get infiltration faster. Those are all reasons for plants being actually enhancing the infiltration. Other reasons, well, it slows down the overland flow. So you have slow and then rains, you have vegetation, slow down the water that is just flowing out through the valley, right? So that's another reason. If you have regions that tend to have a crust uh, desertification process, if you have drops splashing on the ground and then forming a crust, the, the fact that you have vegetation protecting the soil from the from the uh, heat of the of the droplets implies that in that soil, if vegetation you won't form, uh, form a crust, which is usually very impervious and prevents infiltration from happening. So vegetation keeps the good structure and texture of the soil and the mass infiltration. All right. So usually more vegetation means more infiltration. And there is another factor that I think it, it may come later is the fact that because roots are actually taking water, you're generating a negative potential in the soil, right? You're generating a suction. 
So all the water that starts infiltrating will be actually more inclined to go down because you're removing water from there. It's like sucking water, right? Like transpiration. You have transpiration sucking water, pulls up and piles, silent flow. The water comes from the roots, dries up the deeper soil, and that drying of the deeper soil implies that infiltration into the deeper soil is going to be stronger. So that stronger infiltration also has to do with the leaves evaporate the water, right? Okay, so more infiltration, more precipitation, more latent heat flux, and what will be the net effect for rivers, for instance? What will be the river runoff when you have a forest and when you don't have forests, for instance? We think of a more binary example. So, usually, because forests consume a lot of water, transpiration, it means less river runoff in total, unless really you have a lot more precipitation happening there because of the presence of forests, which needs to be a big forest for that to happen, right? Uh, because otherwise the rainfall just probably falls downwind somewhere else. So usually more trees imply less river run, less river district, less water in the rivers, and more aquifer depletion because trees consume a lot of water, right? However, what they do for sure is dampening the seasonality of rivers. So when you have high peaks in river runoff, they tend to be lower because you have more infiltration when it rains. So instead of going through overland flow and then leading to floods in your river, what you usually have is more infiltration because of this infiltration capacity and half vegetation, and that water will take longer to travel all the way to the channel of the river. So that will imply that it dampens the peaks in the hydrograph, which is a good thing for a water manager. You don't want to have floods. And in addition, it saves water for later in the year when you have a dry season. So it dampens the peaks and it dampens the valleys of your river discharge. So it's good. You have fewer floods and you have water when you have droughts. Even if the total integral of discharge may be lower because you are consuming a lot of water for evaporation, the truth is that it flattens the hydrographs, which is a good thing. You have fewer droughts, you have fewer droughts. So when you have a drought, you have still water in your aquifers and your rivers, particularly in your rivers. Um, so those are effects of vegetation on the hydrological cycle that are not the direct effect of, of mold transpiration, but also uh, propagate throughout the entire hydrological cycle. And you can also have other effects like effects on the chemistry of water, as you know, you can have effects on the hill slope stability. Sometimes you have landslides and so on. You have vegetation, it will be actually beneficial for uh, those processes. So, in essence, it has, or vegetation in general, it has a very strong role within the hydrological cycle. And that happens at the ecosystem scale, but also at the global scale. And when I say vegetation again, I mean carbon cycle. Uh, so that you can think of linking cycles of water and carbon. But we also have a links of water and energy cycles. And this is something that I mentioned very early today. And it's very obvious because of evaporation. So you have evaporation taking a lot of energy of the radiation that we get and essentially powering that latent heat flux and then releasing that energy up when you form a cloud. So that latent heat flux, which is here, which is the latent heat of vaporization times the amount of water that is vaporized, is of course the same evaporation that you have here with different units, right? So that's the link between the water balance and the energy balance that is most obvious. There are others that you can think of. Okay. And as you have already guessed, uh, probably the most important variable uh, of this course is evaporation, uh, latent heat flux. So latent and sensible heat flux, for particularly in evaporation, is very important because it's linking energy with water, it's linking energy with carbon, and water with carbon. Um, so this equation is probably the most important equation that you're going to see in this course. I'm not sure if Nico already introduced it to you, but it's the Emma Montes equation. Uh, it was designed by this guy here. We'll see a bit of the history of the equation and, and the derivation of the equation later on during the course. So I'm not going to go through 
through what, what the different variables mean here. But essentially, what this equation is for is to calculate latent heat flux, to calculate evaporation. But you can use it for other things if you actually rearrange it. You see net radiation here. So do you want to know what the net radiation is knowing certain evaporation? You can do it. You can see, for instance, this is water vapor. You can see actually the, well, if you were to look at the energy balance, you would know that this is actually the, when you consider these three terms, it's the sensible heat flux, the residual of these three terms, really. So there are many things that you can look at. You can look at the stomata conductance if you know everything else. So it's essentially this equation, essentially linking also the carbon water and energy cycles together. It's a very important equation in the center of the forest sweep. Um, and what can you use it for, as I said, to calculate evaporation? But maybe what you want to know is, okay, we have certain global warming. So that's going to change evaporation by how much? So you look at the effect of temperature in this equation, which comes to this, um, this, and I'm not going to tell you too much about that because you'll see it in the next lecture. But that will be a way to actually give you a first order guess of what would be the impact of, for instance, global warming on, on the hydrological cycle. How much global warming will increase evaporation according to this, this uh, equation? And then you can think of well, that water vapor going in the atmosphere potentially causing more clouds and rainfall, and so on. Okay. Another thing that you can do is to look at the effect of land cover changes. You change the land cover, you change your stomata resistance, maybe also the aerodynamic resistance, maybe you change the albedo, which is coming here in the net radiation. And different things in here. So, what would be the impact of um, your river discharge of planting a forest? Well, you see, okay, what was the evaporation here? What would be the evaporation if I plant a forest? I modify these terms, and then I see with this much precipitation I get, if I have this evaporation now and I'll have this, this is how much runoff I'm going to have left after planting a forest. So, you can use this equation for, for many things. Okay. <clears throat> And one of the things I mentioned here is monitoring the needs for irrigation because at the end of the day, transpiration is water used by vegetation, water consumption. Right? So plants want to be one half sufficient moisture in the soil to be able to open the stomata maximum to capture CO2 and growth. So you need to have in the soil the amount of moisture that's required to maintain this evaporation at the potential. Or the potential evaporation. You'll see it later if you haven't seen it in other courses. It's an important concept. So you want to irrigate up to the point in which the plants do not think twice about opening the stomata to capture CO2. They just open, they get the CO2 because they know they have sufficient moisture to allow them to do that. So, how much do I have to irrigate? Well, the difference between actual and potential evaporation, the difference between what you get in this formula, which is the actual evaporation. And what would be the maximum that would occur if plants had sufficient moisture in the soil? That's essentially your irrigation if you want to simplify it. Okay. One part of this equation that is very important and that we will see in the next week actually is this collapse of the air relationship. Uh, I'm just going to tell you now what it means. It means that you have water and air, you can hold more water vapor in that water. And that relationship is exponential. The water vapor that's the temperature. So if you if you are in the tropics at uh, 20 degrees and you increase 10 degrees the temperature of the air, then you can get a lot more water vapor in that air. If you are here at zero and you go to 10, then you can get just a little bit more water vapor in the air. This is exponential. Okay. And I think that with the things that we have seen in the lecture today, we already understood quite well that vegetation is not just, or ecosystems are not just the response of what happens in the atmosphere. You have seen probably ecosystem classifications that tell you with this temperature and this precipitation, you should have a coniferous forest. Well, vegetation is not just one way interacting with the atmosphere in which it gets all the forcing precipitation, the temperature, the humidity, and then it reacts to that. But it's also shaping the atmosphere. It's shaping the atmospheric processes, it's shaping climate, not just the climate it receives and 
and also the one downwind, as you saw in the video at the end. So that is one reason why these maps, when you look at them, these are just example maps, but you can think of a map of temperature and a map of precipitation instead of radiation and evaporation. They look similar to the maps of vegetation, right? But it's not just because vegetation grows when the temperature and the availability of moisture is suitable, but also because the vegetation activity and state affects the temperature and affects the precipitation. Now, here's the right? And that's why we call, we, we refer to this process as the feedbacks, right? As I mentioned before, at the beginning of the lecture, you have, for instance, precipitation happening, then you have more vegetation growing, and then there is more transpiration, and then you have more clouds and more rain. That would be an entire feedback. That's what we call a positive feedback, actually, or because it's positive for anything, but because an initial change is amplified by the system. So you have an increase in precipitation, leading to more vegetation, leading to more transpiration, leading to more cloud formation and rain. Again, and again, more vegetation, and again, more rain. That is what we call a positive feedback. Our positive feedbacks, they just, they're just like vicious cycles that you're just keeping on amplifying until there is an external driver that stops it. In the case I'm talking about, for instance, you have an anti cyclone with sunny skies coming, and then rainfall stops. So something silly because we're working at a different scale, the vegetation doesn't grow uh, during cycles. But you get the example. So that would be a positive feedback that is stopped by an external cause. You also have negative feedbacks in the system. Let me think of a negative feedback. So you have more CO2 in the atmosphere and plants grow. And because they grow, they take more CO2 from the atmosphere. They photosynthesize, they take more CO2. So that is essentially dampening the initial increase in CO2. That's a negative feedback. More CO2, then that causes more photosynthesis and biomass. That implies more uptake of CO2 and less atmospheric CO2. So that is a negative feedback. Negative feedback essentially is self, um, self regulating. So the initial change is dampened, attenuated by the system. It's the opposite than the, in climate science, we usually want to have negative feedbacks. We want to make sure that the perturbations that we have in the system, let's say CO2 emissions, but it could be anything else, are actually dampened by the system. So the system is resilient and resistant to the perturbations of the whole zone. If we have positive feedbacks, that's not a good thing because a little perturbation can actually be amplified and become a lot bigger. Unfortunately for us, that's usually what happens in the climate system. And that you'll see later next year, actually the climate change process is worse. But essentially what I want you to keep in mind from today is that vegetation and salt moisture regulate climate conditions through different feedbacks. Uh, usually when I refer to feedback from soil moisture and precipitation, I'm talking about soil moisture effect of precipitation. But I could also be referring to like feedback, precipitation to soil moisture or moisture to precipitation. That's another positive feedback, right? More rainfall, more soil moisture, more evaporation, more rainfall, more soil moisture, more evaporation. Okay. So how do vegetation and soil moisture affect uh, climate conditions? We've, been, we've seen already uh, the, the, the mechanism. I, I, I'll just paraphrase. Well, through the carbon cycle, which we haven't mentioned much, but of course, if you take CO2 from the atmosphere for photosynthesis, you have less greenhouse effect, and potentially lower temperature, right? So that is something that I, I was just taking for granted that you know. So, through that carbon exchange, ecosystems, of course, affect temperature. That's something that you are aware of. And that's, in fact, the reason why people or policymakers want to plant forests, because they want to have more CO2 taken from the atmosphere on the premise that that will lower the temperatures, right? So the carbon cycle exchanges of vegetation affect temperature, affect climate. That's clear. In addition to that, you have also not biochemical processes, but biophysical processes from vegetation affected like transpiration and interception loss, right? And in addition, the characteristics of vegetation. The albedo, for instance, you know what the albedo is probably, right? You, you recall it's probably the same touch. Well, 
essentially the reflection of the surface. So if you have um, a surface that is very dark, there will be more net radiation because there will be less outgoing shortwave radiation, less reflection of solar energy. So there will be more net radiation for evaporation and for heating of the atmosphere. Sensible electric heat flux. Right? So when you have vegetation, uh, usually you have a darker surface, meaning a lower albedo, meaning more energy being captured. If it is darker, you have more radiation being trapped. That's why your dark t shirts in the summer they get warmer. Right? So having vegetation being darker implies more net radiation, which implies more evaporation and more sensible heat flux, both more wetting of the atmosphere and more warming of the atmosphere. More evaporation and more sensible heat flux, more turf and more latent heat flux and more sensible heat flux, which is the same. All right. So through that process, vegetation also affects climate through the albedo. And the albedo relates to the color of vegetation, but also the structure. Because if you have like a multi-layer structure, the radiation from the sun finds it harder to escape later. So it's not reflected so easily in the atmosphere. It's reflected here and then bounce back and so on. And at the end, you have a larger fraction that's absorbed. So it's about the color and it's about the structure of the ecosystem, multi layers. Of the okay. So for those reasons, usually vegetation has, uh, has a high absorption of energy, a low albedo. Okay. So all those things from vegetation affect climate. It's the carbon cycle exchange. It is the color and the structure that change the albedo. It is the transpiration and interception loss. And of course, also the aerodynamics, as we mentioned before. You have vegetation there, it can affect the flow of winds and it can lead to the rays of the air, uh, formation of clouds and rainfall, and it can lead to other processes. Okay, so all those, all those aspects matter when it comes to the ecosystem interaction with the climate system, with the atmosphere. All right. In the case of soil moisture, it's very straightforward. If you don't have water to evaporate, all that net radiation energy is going to go to warm up the atmosphere. So imagine you have a certain surplus of radiation here, net radiation, more radiation from the sun coming that we are emitting, which is a normal condition during the daytime, and you don't have water to evaporate. So if you don't have water to evaporate, all that surplus of energy is going to go to warm up the surface and then a sensible heat flux to warm up the air on top. So the sensible heat flux and the latent heat flux, they are competing dissipation mechanisms, right? So your heat dissipations that are competing. If you have plenty of water, typically the latent heat flux is higher. If you don't have water, the latent heat flux is small and the sensible heat flux is higher. You don't have any water, the latent heat flux doesn't happen. There's no evaporation, there is no water, right? And all the net radiation you know, goes to warm up the soil and the atmosphere. So sensible heat flux. Okay, so that's why soil moisture is key on this, because if soil moisture drops below a level that we call critical soil moisture, then it starts to limit this partition between latent and uh, sensible heat. So essentially, if we think of transpiration. Plants start transpiring a little less than they would if they have no moisture. So they start photosynthesizing less than they would if they have no moisture. That's why for ir irrigation, we want to keep the irrigation so that the soil moisture is always above this critical soil moisture. Because the moment in which soil moisture goes below critical soil moisture, which is somewhere between fertile plants and fertile plants, so it's a relatively always tall, but not too much. When it drops below that, you start having a uh, struggle for plants to open this to water to capture CO2 because they realize they don't have that much water in the soil to allow them to actually open the stomata that much. So you increase your stomata resistance to CO2 easier. But for the soil evaporation as well, you have your pores holding the water more tightly to have less water. And therefore, there is less operation that will occur if you have more water. Over here, other critical soil moisture variations in soil moisture don't matter because still evaporating potentially, it's still evaporating as much as you could based on the atmospheric amount of water. So, you have a certain amount of radiation, then it doesn't matter if your soil moisture is here or here, you're going to evaporate the same because it's limited by the amount of radiation, not by the soil moisture. 
at the moment in which you have some moisture below critical, then you start using that radiation to sensitive heat flux, warm and the moist in the air less because you have less water evaporating and moving as late as you can. Okay. And that's why so moisture affects climate. It affects climate because it regulates the latent and sensible heat, therefore the moistening and the warming of the atmosphere, and for the temperature and the precipitation. And that can be mediated through vegetation, through transpiration, right? So transpiration affected by some moisture, or it can be just some moisture affecting the air soil evaporation. So moisture also changes a little. We're not going to get into that, but usually most soils are darker. So that's also another reason why moisture may actually matter. So I'm not going to go through this, but you can look at them there if you want. Uh, but they are pretty straightforward uh, diagrams of what happens when you dry a soil, and then you pass it because the moisture and the evaporation starts going down, and, and so on. But this is actually something that probably I should mention is that if you think of some moisture as a topsoil, you know that plants uh, that don't have deep roots will be very much affected by that. But if you have trees that have deep, deep roots that may be actually tapping onto water reservoirs, uh, for instance, at the aquifer level, which happens sometimes, is the water table. So you sometimes have trees actually extracting the water directly from the aquifer. In that case, it doesn't matter what happens here, because plants, and they are not stupid, they usually take the water from where it's moistly accessible. And it's got nothing to do with consciousness, neither. This is pure physics. If you have a pool of water at a deep level, then the water potentially will determine where the water comes from, more than where it's moistly accessible. Right? So, in that sense, if you have the tree roots all the way rooted into the water table, then it's so moisture, the air won't matter too much because transpiration will continue even when the topsoil is dry. So that's why the vegetation types matter quite a lot for this effective impact on climate, right? And the importance of soil moisture. As I say, most of the importance of soil moisture passes through vegetation because transpiration is much bigger than soil evaporation. And this probably addresses the question that you mentioned before of, the, um, of how this plays in terms of temperature. So what we believe right now, and there has been a lot of debate over the last 10 years on this, is that if you have a tropical forest, like the one you saw in the video with the Amazon, the effect that it has on temperature is that of cooling. It pulls down the temperature. Why? Because first of all, it uses a lot of radiation to latent the heat flux, to evaporate water. So there is not that much left to warm up the environment through sensitive heat flux. So more latent, little sensible because of all this transpiration, right? So that's one thing. That's why you see here strong evaporative cooling. It, it is not really evaporative cooling. I mean, people call it like that, but it's really evaporative non warming because the reason why evaporation is cooling is because. It's using the energy that otherwise would be used for sensible heat flux to warm up the atmosphere. Okay. So that is actually causing the cooling. In addition to that, you have the storage of carbon from the atmosphere, right? So you're removing the heat from the atmosphere, which is what everybody thought, uh, talks about when they think about planting forests. So, yes, you're removing CO2 from the atmosphere, you have less greenhouse effect, and that's a very global impact rather than an ecosystem impact, right? So that also cools down. And you do have a bit of a counterbalancing effect because the albedo is, is actually very low. So you have a lot of energy being trapped in the system because the forest is very dark and it's very uh, dense. So it traps a lot of net radiation. So you have a high net radiation, but still the other two effects balance out and you have a net negative effect. In the case of rural forest, it's not like that. When you plant a forest in somewhere like Scandinavia, the effect it has is that of warming. And the reason why it warms is that first, they don't consume a lot of water. And so they don't cool down a lot through evaporation. The reason for that is not because they don't photosynthesize and open the stomata, but when they open the stomata, since the air is cold, there is not much net radiation, 
the evaporation doesn't happen too much. So they don't evaporate water from the leaves at the same rate as they do in, in, in the Amazon, for instance. So since the potential evaporation, is us like that, is a lot lower, even if they open the stomata fully to capture CO2, to do photosynthesis, they don't lose the same amount of water vapor. Okay, so that's one reason. In addition to that, well, yeah, they still have their positive effect of capturing CO2 from the atmosphere, they photosynthesize, they stop that biomass, so that's good. But the problem they have is that the albedo of boreal forests is actually very low, especially very low, so they are very dark, very dark and very low in compared to the alternative, which is not having a forest and usually having a surface covered by snow, which has an albedo of like 0.9, implying that about 90% of the radiation that the uh, from the sun that the snow surface gets is actually reflected back into the atmosphere. So it's very little net radiation in a snow covered grassland. But if you plant a forest, even if it snows on top, you still have a very dark surface because of a multi layer ecosystem uh, that, that you're dealing with. So when you look at a forest from space, even if it has snow, it's quite dark. Uh, and that implies much more net radiation. So that's why this effect. Here is so big, and it implies that all that radiation being trapped is actually overcoming the positive effect, the cooling effect of transpiring more and capturing CO2. So, planting forests in Scandinavia or combating forests like global warming is a very bad idea, and probably at the latitudes in which we are, it would need to be actually addressed because it's not clear. That's the effect in temperate forests when you see here. Okay. But since we know that uh, land cover can affect climate and in different ways, then we can also think of what is the impact of the land cover changes that we already have introduced and the ones that we can introduce in the future. So how through land cover changes, we are actually modifying climate. And we can even intentionally modify the land cover to change climate. And that's what we call geoengineering. When you decide to say, uh, okay, I'm going to plant a forest here because I want to cool down the environment, that's called to engineer. But it could be also, I'm going to plant potatoes instead of rice because they are lighter and they have a higher albedo. That's also geoengineering, right? So we are also going to see geoengineering um, by the end of the lectures. So not just the effect of the atmosphere of land, the effect of the land on the atmosphere, what is the effect of changing land cover, but also how we can change land cover to affect climate in a certain fashion. And why is this so important? Well, especially important for climatic extremes because it's when the land surface plays the biggest role in climate. And I'll tell you why in a second. So, of course, when the land surface plays the biggest role in climate, that means also that if you change the land surface conditions and you change the land cover, is when you're going to have the biggest impact, right? So why extreme events? Because those, for instance, I'm going to put you an example here before going into detail about this, which is something that we'll see during the lectures. If you were to have, for instance, a drop, it doesn't rain for some reason, and the soil starts right now, what you're going to have is that the next anti-cycle that you get with clear skies, sunny weather, a lot of net radiation, a lot of solar radiation. Since you don't have the soil moisture to evaporate with that radiation, you're gonna warm up. So that's usually what happens here when we have the heat wave, like the ones that we had last summer. So it doesn't rain a lot of in the summer or in spring, so the soil is not particularly wet. So what happens is that when the normal heat event comes, it encounters dry soils. Soils that cannot evaporate a lot of water, that can not evaporate potentially at potential evaporation rate, but uh, actually below critical soil moisture. So what happens is that the majority of that net radiation that comes with a heat wave, a clear skies, and so on, is actually being used to sensitive heat plants. It's not being used to evaporate the water in the soil because we don't have it. But it's actually preferentially being used to form up the environment. So you have a positive feedback in which the initially hot conditions are amplified by the dry soils. So you have dry soils, you have hot conditions, 
since that hot condition and extra radiation you have cannot be dissipated through evaporating water because you have the water to evaporate, then you have an extra warming from the land surface, extra warming of the air, which dries out the soil even more, which implies even more sensible heat flux, which implies even more warming, even more drying of the soil. It's a positive feedback that is very clear. And that implies that you have heat waves and droughts occurring at the same time, which is something that over the last three decades we have encountered uh, disproportionately frequently. And the reason for that is most likely global warming, in which you have a background temperature that is higher per se. And then, of course, you lead to this feedback triggering much more frequently than before. And that without counting on the different precipitation patterns that we are having because of uh, global warming. So it's simply because of the fact that you have a higher temperature at the beginning of the summer, and then the drying out of the soils will imply that when you have a little heat wave, it can become a mega heat wave. Okay. Likewise, for the floods, if, 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 if you have a lot of rainfall, and then you have moist soils, and then you have more evaporation, then you may have more rainfall, more, more soils, and that will actually lead to flood. So that's why I say that the land conditions play the most important role during extreme events. And that has to do with the fact that they are positive feedbacks, what we are discussing, right? So they amplify the original perturbation in the atmosphere, the original atmospheric signal, and they maximize it. That's why if we have the ability to change the land cover, we may be able to prevent this happening, this from happening, these feedbacks from happening, and we may actually even have negative feedbacks that dampen the original atmospheric signal. You can think of, for instance, if you have trees that are actually deep rooted into the aquifer, when you have the first heat wave coming, then they can still transpire a lot of water and they don't warm up the environment with sensible heat flux as, as you would otherwise. So you can treat the land cover to essentially prevent extreme climatic events from occurring. Okay. And at the end of the day, this is the only reason why I put this slide here. Whatever happens at the surface will still depend on how the atmosphere digests that change. If you have, for instance, a lot of wind blowing out the heat or not, or if you have a big atmospheric bottom layer, that implies that you mix everything with a big container of air. So the reaction of the atmosphere to the sensible latent heat flux partition, the albedo of the surface and so on, will imply at the end that we may experience three degrees more temperature or five degrees more temperature, because the atmosphere will also react differently, depending on, for instance, the uh, large scale synoptic conditions and so on. But these are things that we'll see during the course. So we'll go all the way from the initial atmosphere change to the land surface change that that implies, and in turn back to what that means from the atmosphere, all right? So, and that's the structure of the force, atmosphere, surface, heat, right? So I'm not gonna go through this here now, but this is actually what the class model that you use in the practicals does. It is essentially following the momentum, mass, and energy conservation laws, like any climate model. So the atmosphere of the land, it doesn't matter. And the gas, uh, ideal gas laws, which is the one that uh, we'll see. Uh, next lecture, actually, but you probably know already. Okay, so question. Any question first? No? If I'm rushing too much, let me know. I'm also a little concerned about the computer switching off because uh, I still don't know what the battery is. I'm going to check it. But, um, okay, so. This one is a little easier. It's not easier. The question is not easy, but the, I think the, some of the answers are so ludicrous that probably you guess right. So higher soil moisture may mean more evaporation, but that can lead to fewer storms, which is a little weird. So we said like, if we have, for instance, more precipitation than you have wetting of the soils, we said that that implies more evaporation and that may mean more clouds in the rainfall. That's a positive feedback. Uh, what I'm saying here is that it can be a negative feedback. More rainfall, wetting of the soils, and then you have less 
evaporation potentially, I don't know, and less cloud formation and rain. So there is a mechanism by which that can actually happen, that feedback can turn negative. So that's essentially what I'm asking you for here. If you have high soil moisture, it may need more evaporation, but that can still lead to fewer rainfall storms instead of more. And the possibilities of tree leaves absorb the water vapor. It, it snows instead. Photosynthesis is increased. The air is already moist, or God wants it that way. So, A, who thinks it's A? Trees absorb the A. Who thinks it's B? No one? Doesn't sound reasonable? No, actually, it doesn't sound uh, C. See a lot of hands. Maybe. Okay. Well, you're not voting. D. Okay. And E. No? Okay. So the right answer is D, actually. So why? Yeah, congratulations. <laughs> The reason for that, maybe let's go through the reason why some of them are absolutely nonsense. So you may have, so the question probably comes down to, can you actually have more evaporation and that leads to this rain here? So tree leaves absorb water vapor. So presume it's like evaporation happens and trees just absorb it. I don't know how that happens. Again, trees don't take water from the atmosphere, they take it from the roots. Uh, very weird location that builds here. Um, it snows instead. That doesn't make any sense. So I'll just pass. Photosynthesis is increased. Uh, well, if you have, okay, so yeah, photosynthesis increased, but I'm not sure how that would change precipitation directly. Uh, so I'm a little confused about that answer. Uh, so if it rains more and you have dry soil, yes, photosynthesis will be increase because your soil moisture was limiting the photosynthesis you were below critical soil moisture and when the soil gets wetter the plant is able to penestomata photosynthesize because it's got the water to lose but uh, that will only happen if you have soil below critical soil moisture and that does not explain why you would actually have less rainfall layer so the reason for that is that you have air being already moist and i will tell you why I think because we, even if you guess right, then you don't know. Um, so what happens actually, what can happen is this negative feedback. You have more rain that wets the soil, that means more evaporation, but suddenly you have less rain. And why would that happen? So let's think maybe the other way around because it's probably easier. If you have a dry soil because it hasn't rained, then you have more sensible heat flux and less latent heat flux. How can that lead to more rainfall? The same, the same question that flipped around just putting minus in where I said plus. So the thing that happens is that if you have dry soils that don't evaporate a lot, but generate a lot of sensible heat, they warm up the air next to the surface and that generates convection. It's like in a pan when you're cooking pasta and you're still warming it from below and then start generating convection cells because the air, in the case of a pan, is actually the liquid uh, that is in the bottom is lighter, it's warmer. So when, when you warm up a fluid, gas or liquid, it becomes lighter. So then it tends to go up and then you start generating a circulation cell, convection. So that's essentially what happens. If you have a sensible heat flux being very high here at the surface, you're warming the air very much, so you're making it lighter, and that air will tend to move up more strongly. If that happens, and that air is already moist, as I was saying, yeah, that's going to actually lift the air, cool it down, form clouds, and lead to rainfall. Right? When the air moves up, as you will see in the next lecture, it cools down, and then it condenses the moisture it has. So it can happen that what is really limiting the rainfall. It's not the amount of moisture in the air, so it's not the latent heat, but it's the sensible heat, the amount of warming of the air that will generate that convection and will lift the air to cool it down. Right? So 
When I said before, precipitation depends on two factors, humidity content and the presence of, of cloud nuclei. I was probably lying. We needed a third factor, which is cooling that to actually saturate it to form uh, liquid. And through that con convection that is generated as you warm the surface, you cool the air up and you cool it. So all the moisture that it has, it is actually condensing and that can lead to storms. So sometimes in the summer when you have a dry soil and you don't have any evaporation there, it's actually when you get the worst thunderstorms because all the air that comes from the sides, as you can see here, as it passes through your town or whatever, as it is so warm and dry there and so much sensitive heat flux is first warming up and then it leaves, it's lifted because it's lighter. And then all that moisture that was coming from the surroundings forms clouds there and leads to thunderstorms in the afternoon. If that soil were to be actually wetter and you had latent heat flux instead of sensible heat flux, that wouldn't happen. So that's why sometimes it's so moisture precipitation heat flux can be negative. So the standard case would be positive, in which you have more rain, it's more slow moisture, more evaporation, which leads to more clouds, and it's more precipitation. But in some cases, like for instance, with thunder thunderstorms, in which you have air from the surroundings being wet, the heat flux can be negative, applying the regional dry soils can lead to more rainfall instead of less rain. Or the opposite, if you want to think of it as in the question, you have more rain, so the soils wet more, and that implies that if you have an um, air mass that is wet, it won't be raised up and form the rain. Ooh, that's usually meaning five minutes. Uh, okay, so just a, but this is less than five minutes what we have left. Uh, this is a course three of what we are going to see in the next few days. So. Today we had introduction. Ah, first some questions. Uh, well, these are the type of questions that you're gonna be able to answer. Maybe you can go through them later, but essentially they are the same that we discussed today as how are photosynthesis and transpiration interconnected, uh, what happens with the sun radiation in the ecosystem, and also the things that we haven't discussed, like for instance, what will be the climate in mega cities and why through like I mean, energy balance and atmosphere response and so on. So those are the kind of questions that we are going to be interested in in this course. And we will do so going through this uh, course content. Essentially, the next week we have the atmospheric vertical profiles. So this is really atmosphere properties. So we will see things such as the glasses clapeyron equation that I showed before, but also some other things such as atmospheric stability and so on. Then we have a lecture on boundary layer dynamics. So this is the atmospheric boundary layer. What you see here is temperature. It warms up during the day because of the surface central heat flux and it moistens because of the surface latent heat flux. And that generates the convection that I was meaning before. So you can see how actually the warm layer is actually moving up because it's lighter. And during the day, it's first mixing, and you can see that it has an inversion. A very different temperature up here. And you can see that it takes air from here every time you move stuff. So we'll go through that in lecture three. So this is about one kilometer. In this case, this is for the Netherlands, this is a simulation for the Netherlands. Uh, this is what class simulates the model that you will be using, but actually only for one variable. It doesn't have a horizontal dimension. Okay, it's more like this. It's very simple. Uh, we will have a lecture on the ecosystem radiation budget. We'll go then into specifically the land surface partitioning. Already, this is the land surface block that we're moving. So in the atmospheric block, we had uh, atmospheric properties, water vapor, atmospheric boundary layer, and radiation in the atmosphere. When we go to the land surface, sorry for that, we have the energy partitioning at the, start, uh, at the land surface. And then we have a specific lecture on latent heat flux distillation. And um, this is where we will have the derivation of the equation that you saw before, the phenomenon D equation. 
Um, we'll dedicate it entirely to latent heat flux. And we'll have a lecture on transpiration that is explaining entire hydraulic transport in plants, which is something that you already know quite a lot about. So uh, it will be a little, a little more brief. And that will have the later, I guess, lecture by Brianna Madan right after. Uh, so it'll be a shorter lecture. Then we have the first lecture of the feedbacks, which is the soil moisture and vegetation feedbacks. Well, we'll go through all the possible feedback interactions out here between the land surface and climate, precipitation, temperature, things that we have already discussed today and many others. Then how do we change the land use and land cover to affect those feedbacks and affect our climate? So a bit on geoengineering, but also on the effect of cities on climate and things like that. And then we'll have a last lecture in which we will put that into a global perspective, a bit more in light of the courses that you'll have next year. Um, and there in that lecture, I'll go through all the possible questions for the exam. We'll have at least one hour to see sample questions that you guys can actually ask things and so on. And of course, any other time that you guys want to ask anything, you just have to, the, to be clear. So that's the structure of the course. And uh, this is essentially the key ideas that we discussed today. I'm not going to go through them now, but we'll have a slide like this in every lecture. And next lecture, we'll start again with this, and I will revise it for you before we start with the material.